All right, Reverend Jones, you are on tape and rolling, so we want to talk about your trip to Korea. Okay. And you can do whatever format you want. We can edit and do this stuff later, but tell us about it. I was very intrigued by hearing that this was the most inspirational, impactful trip that you've had since being a pastor at Mount Zion. So maybe you can just share whatever you feel comfortable with sharing. Okay. You know, you and I talked, and um, obviously we have a relationship that goes back here at Mount Zion now almost two years, almost to the date. It's been about that long. I remember that because two years ago in 2010, I was preaching down at Shiloh. It was in July of 2010, okay. and you came down there. And so that was in the beginning part of it. So I started pastoring, uh, as you recall, November of 2009. Mm -hmm. And so about six, eight months in, we started talking about um, whether this would make sense for you in terms of a field education site. So the context for my ministry experience today is what, May the 17th, 2012. So uh, three years ago was the month that I first preached here as a candidate, then became the pastor in November of 2009. And the reason why that all connects to the trip is because this Korea trip actually emerged from uh, a relationship with my uh, wife's fellow school board member. So my wife serves on the school board at Wissahickon, and there is a gentleman there whose name is Young Park, and he's a Korean-American, and he expressed some interest and curiosity about me becoming a pastor because he knew about my corporate background. Mm -hmm. Well, he came to the installation banquet, and he also came to the installation services, which was pretty healthy commitment. Both of those things were about four hours. And so I later learned at a dinner with him and his wife that there are these trips that go to Korea. And they started, well, the trips started 18 years ago, in 1994, but they were prompted from the Rodney King beating and subsequent business lootings in Los Angeles in 1992. A lot of those businesses were owned by Koreans, and it was the African American community that was upset about the Rodney King beatings. So as a result, something called the Friendship Tour was founded, a Friendship Council, and since then there have been several trips going there. The lead person is a local area pastor, and uh, he's in Darby, Pennsylvania, um, and um, so uh, Pastor Peter Wong. Co um, leads the delegation. So Young Park, I came to learn after he mentioned it to me about the trip because about a month or so before the trip was to take off, he called and said, may I give you, may I give um, Pastor Wong your number and would you still be interested in going? And that's how the trip transpired. The reason why I said it was very powerful was not only the way in which the trip came to be, um, but also because I went hearing about some Korean churches, but not knowing a lot about them. I knew they had some very large churches there, but I really didn't know very much about um, Korean culture. Um, my oldest son's best friend happens to be Korean, and so what little bit I really knew was as much from him as it was him being um, Fran, uh, my son's friend. And anything else. And I do remember him saying to me, you know, my grandmother, she really harbors a lot of uh, pain from her experiences regarding Japan. Mm -hmm. And I did not know that history at all. Occupation. You know, exactly. Mm -hmm. And what that became a part of this was because uh, when we went to Korea, we not only learned about the Korean church culture, but we got a good sampling of its 20th century history. So the occupation between 1910 and 1946, which I really knew virtually nothing about other than just a couple of mm -hmm. references. Knew a little bit about the Korean War from school, but at the time I went to school it was almost a footnote and overwhelmed by Vietnam, which was actually in real time when I was in um, uh, grade school. And so I knew about that, but really didn't know a whole lot else. I knew about South Korea from a business standpoint. So the opportunity to go there and spend 11 days and to get immersed in a culture that I think has a lot of um, 
aspects of their history and culture that could be good learning for us was very, very powerful. Mm -hmm. So that paints the picture in part. I also think the reason why it was powerful was because it was about 18 hours every day of concentration in ministry. Okay. When you get right down to it. I mm -hmm. mean, we were worshiping or traveling nearly every morning at 6 a.m. And we really rarely got back before 10 o'clock or 9 at the earliest. Mm -hmm. And then because we also had roommates, and um, my roommate was a fellow pastor here in Philadelphia, um, and we would come back and debrief, if you will, mm -hmm. and just process and talk about what we learned and experienced. So on just a lot of levels, the historical level, the way the trip came about, the learning about uh, churches that I had never really seen before, the fact that you've got 11 days of really focused time and attention mm -hmm. without the other responsibilities of church work, preparing a sermon, uh, just the normal things that go on in church life, not to mention family life and all of that, all of which is wonderful, but to have that kind of um, 10, 11 straight days mm -hmm. of 18 hours immersion uh, made it very, very powerful, plus some of the content which we can talk about um, in terms of whatever questions you have. But that's why I said it was powerful. Okay. What is... Um what are a couple of the memories that you think will stay with you? Um, I guess from uh, looking out and seeing different things and also which some things that you may have experienced. I think um, the first thing that comes to mind is early morning worship. And I don't just mean Sunday morning, early morning. One of the things that we learned about, and I had no idea of this aspect, I just knew, like I said, of some Korean churches, and I had heard of them but did not know. One of the very powerful experiences of our quote-unquote host church was that that church, the Myung-Sung Presbyterian Church, was built primarily off of early morning prayer. Mm -hmm. And what that meant was that it's not just early morning prayer on one day, but literally six days a week. Mm -hmm. And that was a new experience. I will never forget that. I'll never forget, for example, 6 a.m. on Saturday morning, going to worship, um, and we all traveled as a group. There were about 25 of us or so. Um, and at 6 a.m., this happens to be one of those very large churches in Korea. So the Myung Song Presbyterian Church um, has over 100,000 members, and, and it's not only the largest Presbyterian church in Seoul, it's the largest Presbyterian church in the world. And they worship every week over 60,000 people. Um, so you can imagine that the sanctuary is very large, 15,000 plus people, um, perhaps as many as 20, I don't know, but at least 15,000. Mm -hmm. And so at 6 o'clock in the morning, on a Saturday morning, nothing special in terms of it, and there were 15,000 people or so in that sanctuary at 6 a.m. on a Saturday. Probably even more powerful than that from just the aspect that I won't forget. But there were children that were in the front. So some sanctuaries have stairs mm -hmm. on the front. So imagine a whole lot of young children mm -hmm. uh, there in front just kind of sitting, being there more or less attentive. Um, that I won't forget because that not only was that experience just overwhelming, but then throughout the week uh, we had a chance to go and participate in their services. So Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, they actually have three, perhaps four, but three for sure, early morning prayer service, 5 a.m., 6 a.m., 7 a.m. So the first time the experience was, wow, the place was large. Mm -hmm. There was a size as well as early morning aspect. We were past that by the time we went back on Monday and, and Tuesday and Wednesday and Thursday. But to see people coming out of a 5 a.m. service as you were getting there before 6 and others rushing, if you will, to get in. That I will never forget. Personally, I won't forget the opportunity to have preached there mm -hmm. and to see what it's like. This is a first time experience for me teach, pe preaching, or teaching for that matter, in a church setting where there was a translator. That was a new experience for me. I had that experience in a corporate side mm -hmm. of things, but not uh, in preaching. 
uh, I won't forget that. And just the opportunity to uh, personally witness that. Um, there's so much more that I can think about, but those first impressions are certainly a part of it. And I would say is related to that. I mentioned the host church and others, and we, we also visited other churches mm -hmm. as well. Not all were that size. We went to a, um, an English-speaking church, much smaller church. We also, uh, some of us went to a smaller church Sunday afternoon uh, to support one another. As many of us got a chance to preach, I mm -hmm. think six, no, 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 more than that. Originally, it was only going to be four of us that were going to preach. But then I think they found other opportunities and uh, maybe eight or nine of us got a chance to preach. So um, not all the churches were large like that. I don't want to leave that impression. Mm -hmm. But the, what was consistent also was and, and memorable was the sense of um, togetherness and speed with which certain things happened there. Speed from the standpoint of um, when the offering was taken, we went to not only the 6 a.m. service on Saturday at that particular church, but we also went on Sunday at 11 o'clock. The pastor was preaching both the 6 a.m. on Saturday and the 11 o'clock service on that Sunday and the 7 uh, p.m. service that evening on Sunday. So we went to those services as well. Well, on Sunday, it's, uh, they, I don't recall whether they took an offering on Saturday. Mm -hmm. I don't think they did at the prayer services, the worship services, but they did on Sunday. And I remember the speed with which it was taking place. So imagine you've got all these people in there, and there were three rows of us that had special seats for this delegation. By the time that they had just done our three little rolls, because several of us were still reaching in our pockets and, you know, getting everything together because we didn't know the order of service and all of that. By the time they literally got through our three rolls, they had done the entire church. It was less than eight minutes. Wow. <laughs> and it was, it was remarkable. Um... I later learned from actually uh, the wife of my school board members, uh, uh, yeah, person Young Park, his wife. Um, she came on the trip also, not with us, and Young did not come with us. He came on business purposes on his own, and his wife often uh, accompanies him when he uh, comes over to Korea. So she was, they were with us for a couple of days of the trip, and she said something to me that was very profound and very helpful. She said that, you know, we, in Korea, we move as one. Mm -hmm. And as simple as that was, it put a lot of things in perspective for me. It is a culture where, uh, having been to another culture that I would call quote-unquote isolated, I've been to Japan and mm -hmm. done business there and that kind of yeah. thing, where persons, more or less same ethnicity and all of that there. Some variation, but by and large, simple. So Korea's like that also. So they don't have the challenges of diversity that all the benefits of that that we have in the US. But that sense of moving as one, when she said that to me on the bus, mm -hmm. it made sense because one of the dominant impressions that I remember was the speed and the efficiency of moving as one. The other thing that it did is that some of our uh, guides would often say, hurry up and come together, and it became a uh, almost a laughing thing to us because we were all kind of kidding, and, and mm -hmm. since uh, nearly all of us were African Americans, the whole sense of hurry up yeah. and all yeah. this, and in fact we call one guy chop chop in terms of he was hurrying, and it became uh, a difference in culture we noticed, but for me, I didn't understand it as well until she said that. Yeah. Then I realized what was happening. What was happening was, in their culture, you move as one. And so even despite different age and mobility issues, everybody is to stay together and move as one. And then I understood they were not necessarily hurrying us because anybody was slow or because they were sort of riding us. Right? Mm -hmm. It became, that's how they move. Mm -hmm. Everybody was in place for worship, more or less at the start. It just, it was very much moving as one, and that was incredible to pray. 
And I have a question uh, yeah. about that. How would you phrase that from a, a, a trinity and community aspect theologically mm -hmm. of East versus West and how a community is formed? And you mentioned Japan as kind yes. of individual, also Western, we're kind of individual. Yes. Uh, how do you think that might have played into the culture as well as the church and mm -hmm. how things go? Well, I think it played into it in a couple of different ways. Now, as part of this, since we're documenting this as well, yeah. I should make sure on the real side that you get a copy of the DVD okay. where I preach, not because it's so profound or good, but simply because it gives a visual evidence around that 6 a.m. worship. Mm -hmm. But the other thing is interesting, you should mention that I felt led to preach a sermon that connected oh, this. Wow. And so the title of the sermon was um, Doing Your Part in the Image of God. And so I talked about the diversity of the church using two verses from 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 12 and 27, that we are the body of Christ and there are many members, and then picking up uh, Ephesians chapter 4, verses 15 and 16, really to talk about the uh, coming together and the oneness of the church universally. And so in that sermon, I actually talk and use that comment about moving as one. And so, within that though, there was also the sense that if one understands um, being made in the image of God, not just in the Western thinking that is, is the substance of the person made, mm -hmm. you know, in the sort of Greco notion of self being defined in a particular way within the substance of the self, but looking at the image of God in a Trinitarian way, which has been much more of the thinking about uh, the Imago Dei in the last 10, 15, 20 years. And so the sense that there is particularity with relatedness was the language mm -hmm. I used there. And I think that sense of having both. I think the Eastern culture, namely Korea, since we're talking about that, probably true of Japan also, uh, and maybe other cultures, but I'll stay with Korea for now. That sense of moving together was very strong. Mm -hmm. um, however, they too struggled with the sense of the other mm -hmm. because now Korea and because of, um, especially because of the presence of um, American GIs, mm -hmm. especially American GIs of color, there are children there that were um, now of American and Asian descent. Mm -hmm and they are not a very visible part of the culture and mm -hmm. I think there's a whole story behind that. I know just a little bit about that but I think the challenge is when you say East and West, I think the moving as one, all good. The challenge becomes how do we move as one when we have diversity and differences right. and value those differences. So I think Korea offered a tremendous example and witness of oneness but it did not offer the witness of oneness in the midst of diversity. And mm -hmm. so it becomes um, part of its power and part of its movement is all good, that shared story. But how do we then accept and appreciate and affirm God's movement in multiple stories and still have that sense of oneness? And so I. That's the way I would respond to that. I do believe that within the Eastern Church, linking back prayer and oneness to this, mm -hmm. we went to a Buddhist temple site when we first arrived. We flew into Seoul and then we caught a bus for about a four or five hour bus ride mm -hmm. uh, after flying for 13 hours. And that was, you know, that, that, that took a little stamina. But we got there and the next morning we went to, uh, it was great because we were more in the rural area and we went to a Buddhist temple site where at one point I think they said 10,000 monks were there. Uh, it was now down to a few hundred. But that sense of prayer, that sense of early morning, I think that was a tapestry mm -hmm. that when Christianity came in, in strength in the late 1800s and really into the 1900s, there was that base of mourning, that was that base of prayer, and I believe that what the Myung-Song Church tapped into was not only the sense of worshiping God from a Christian standpoint, but I think it represented a melding and a merging of, we understand, we do this, that kind of prayer, that kind of life, and by the way, that kind of daily mm -hmm. 
representation of worship, which is part of Eastern and Buddhism and so forth in a way that's different than our more or less Sunday-driven uh, or Saturday-driven, uh, if you're Seventh-day Adventist or, or, um, or Jewish, mm -hmm. our culture, this was more of a regular every day. And I think that tapestry of adding that on to and connecting culture with Christ in a setting made that a very powerful experience and more than just a church experience from Yongsong, but it became something, it is something that is now a vibrant part of the Korean Christian culture. And, and a couple of things, um, I went to this uh, Asian Symposium mm -hmm. in April, I Four, believe. you at Fuller? At Fuller, mm -hmm. at Fuller Seminary, which we had Japanese, Korean, um, and Chinese, mm -hmm. and I heard that's what I learned as well mm -hmm. about some of uh, the kind of rigors in different uh, culture and dominant culture mm -hmm. in first, second, two point five generations here. But one of the things I also picked up that it seemed like they had um, incorporated a lot of mysticism in some of um, their practices from what you know they. This is what uh, some of the professors there mm -hmm. said that came from. So they relied much more on the Holy Spirit mm -hmm. than I, I would have thought of, especially from the, the academic side and very intellectual sort of mm -hmm. So that was surprising to me. I was wondering, did you witness any of that or observe any of that? Yes and no. Okay. Here's the yes part. The yes, absolutely, the reliance on the Holy Spirit and the like. So I'll give you a sense of how the morning worship went, uh, where we were. So the gathering was on the hour, mm -hmm. as I said, five, six, and seven. Um, so at 6 o'clock, I'll talk about the one where um, you know, I had an opportunity to share. At 6 o'clock, there was a very tight service. Uh, basically, in my mind, being familiar with the Book of Common Prayer by Presbyterians and having used it personally in some mm -hmm. of my own devotional work, I could follow some of what was going on even when it was in Korean. But essentially, the, the it was 10 minutes of call to worship, call to prayer, some affirmation, some uh, reading. There was a testimony typically by a husband and a wife mm -hmm. uh, about uh, some aspect of their lives and faithfulness. By 6.10, the quote-unquote preacher was up. So I was up from 6.10, but it was always understood you need to be finished at 6.30 mm -hmm. because it's from 6.30 until persons wanted to leave, it was free prayer. And just listening, it was very much prayer that we might associate with Holy Spirit and Spirit-led prayer, and uh, I could not say whether there was a manifestation of glossolalia, okay. but it would not have surprised me if that would have, uh, the speaking in unknown tongues were a part of it, it may mm -hmm. very well have been. I think that in the affirmation, in the preaching, that you could hear the affirmation of the Spirit, also in some of the song choices that were made, particularly some of the choral responses, there were uh, the Holy Spirit was a, 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 a very much included in that. So I think that's true. The no side of it would be that I could not say I witnessed the mysticism part. Okay. But I will say this. I, there was a 30-year conference that was done. So the Myungsung Church, uh, and they were also in a lot of ways a host church, mm -hmm. they um, had a conference. The church was founded in 1980. So two years ago in 2010, they had a conference about it's prayer, early morning prayer. So I had an opportunity, they gave us a book, I had an opportunity to skim through parts of it. And some of the persons did talk about that as not just a benefit, but a real concern. That a concern for syncretism. Okay. That perhaps not only the mysticism in the sense of Holy Spirit, but in the sense of, is this a way of bringing in some elements of um, other faiths that may not necessarily be consistent with Christians. So there was some, that was uh, a reflection that I read in at least two of the presenters. So I do believe the sense of spirit, absolutely. The sense of prayer building onto the fabric of the culture, absolutely. Um, the sense of mysticism was an articulated concern, which would at least lead me to say, maybe we saw it or I saw it, mm -hmm. but could not discern it okay. uh, because of language challenges and my own cultural uh, naivete. And, and with that, did you notice any um, maybe heritage philosophy like Confucianism or talk of the Han or Jin 
Uh, I can't say who I did. So we okay. had an opportunity while we were there to hear um, the pastor of Young Song twice. Mm -hmm. So no, three times. I apologize. He did a full message on the Saturday morning. Uh, he did a full message, of course, on Sunday morning, and he did an extended message on Sunday evening. I did not expect him to do that. We did not expect him to do that. Not that there was anything wrong with it, but we were told that the Sunday evening was more of a celebration of music, and they had a number of things that they were uh, celebrating because the Saturday uh, that we went to the 6 a.m. service was mm -hmm. Children's Day. Then they had a Parents' Day, also that was in the same week. They don't have a, I'm trying to think if they, they did not have a Father's Day or something like Mother's Day, I'll have to get that straight. I'm saying all that to say that we heard three messages okay. and all three of the messages would have translated in my mind to a different culture because they were um, biblical in the sense of where the sources, the, we had a translator for because he preached in Korean. Mm -hmm. And none of those um, other elements that you mentioned okay. were overtly part of it. Okay. It would be the same though if somebody came here and asked, was there a Greek philosophy within the preaching? You'd probably say overtly no, but there could be, there's an underlying right mm -hmm. sense of uh, Greek philosophical influence, even in the way sermons are structured here right. in the U.S. in terms of, uh, you know, more uh, rational, uh, objective kind of communication. So I, I must confess, I would not have known enough about those other areas to know if some of that was consistent with what was being preached. But the messages were biblical. The other thing I would say is that the, uh, interestingly enough, one might think in that kind of uh, East-West piece, mm -hmm. that certain things wouldn't translate. Um, most of the music that we heard there were Western hymns. I say Western not as a result that they all came out of the West, but they, their Korean hymnal, uh, they gave us, a, um, while we were in worship, a Korean and Amer uh, English hymnal. And as I was sharing with the Mount Zion community last night as I began this five series, discussions on the trip, I went and a lot of our things are in there. The, a favorite hymn of Mount Zion is Blessed Assurance. That mm -hmm. was in there. Holy, Holy, Holy was in there. Uh, uh, the Church is One Foundation, one of my favorite hymns, is in there. I, basically, all of the hymns that one might consider as favorites, mm -hmm. um, what is it, all, oh, nearly all were in that hymnal and they made it an active part of their worship so while the 6 a.m. and the early morning prayer was unique and perhaps built onto a culture it wasn't as if the worship elements were very eastern in music or what have you in fact they were much quite contrary to western okay what are some other things that you just want to uh, to share um, that you think are important or stood out? Um. Well, I, you know, since we're talking about worship now, mm -hmm. one thing that I didn't say that uh, did stand out, uh, I had never been in a church where there was a 700 member choir. <laughs> 700 people in choir singing. Um, so visually, that is striking because all of them had robes. Mm -hmm. So it wasn't, I mean, it would be striking if they just stood up and sang, but they were striking visually. Um, and very traditional robes, by the way. Mm -hmm. You know, those robes would very much look good on Mount Zion's yeah. choirs or anybody <laughs> else's. They just, they were that kind of style, if you like that kind of style. Not only that, but they also had, um, for the Sunday worship services, both day and evening, had a full orchestra playing with the choir, and I would conservatively say 30 instruments. I think it was much larger than that. And so the conductor came, and literally conductor, because he's conducting the orchestra, and mm -hmm. he is um, the choir. So he's, I mean, he's a maestro, if you will. And because of the size and scope of that particular church's ministry, it was all of that. So that was something that was very striking. Um, 
both in terms of size, power, selection of music. Um, I was not expecting the musicality mm -hmm. that I heard in the worship. And I mean that not just the formal singing, but also in the message of the pastor, particularly on, well, both days, but Sunday. He integrated in um, not the African-American traditional hoop in a melodic, melodious way of preaching, but he would be preaching and speaking, and then he might hum a few bars of a song. Hmm. And then come right back to speaking, and then he would, and he did that more than once. So that sense of the melody in worship was not anything that I expected. That would be something I'd like to share. The other thing too was that while I'm talking a lot about Myung Song, that Sunday afternoon we went to a smaller church. Total membership 300. Uh, they would seat maybe 200 people, 225 tops. Uh, afternoon service where one of our own preached, uh, maybe a hundred people there, maybe. Um, a woman sang there. It was awesome. And it reminded me of um, African American churches where in Philadelphia in mm -hmm. particular, you could go to a church regardless of how it looks on the outside or the size. And you may encounter somebody with a, just a tremendous voice. And to experience that there was very, very powerful. I mean, it's one thing when you've got many to right. choose from. Mm -hmm. But this was a church. And her, um, it was beautiful. It was, it was angelic and it was absolutely awesome. Not just technically good, somebody's voice, but her artistry, mm -hmm. her depth of feeling as she was singing it, and as somebody who's grown up listening to people play the piano and learn to play the piano in that musical set, it was, it was rich. That was a surprise. Since I'm on music, let me say about another worship experience. On Wednesday, we had an opportunity to go to um, a couple of churches, um, one of which was the Yodo Full Gospel Church. I have was aware that there was the largest church in the world in Korea, but I wouldn't know the name of it before mm -hmm. we went. It turns out that was the church. So we went there and had a Wednesday uh, service there. Um, that church was larger than the Presbyterian church, and at a Wednesday service at 10 o'clock, it was packed, uh, stem to stern, as they say. Mm -hmm. So that was really something. Now at that particular service, they also had a full out choir which, you know, a few hundred people in the choir plus a full out orchestra even at 10 o'clock in the morning may have been related to a school or whatever, I don't know. Um, and one of our own had a chance to preach there, but that was a phenomenal experience for Kevin, I'm sure. Um, but what struck me there also was that they have a culture where because it is emerging and has emerged economically, they, they have a large base of persons who aren't working. Mm -hmm. So in a classic sense, a lot of males, mm -hmm. um, all males if you will, uh, and then a large base of married women who have the option of not necessarily working outside of the home because the actual congregation itself had to be about 95% women. Uh, and then the rest were some older men and then um, minister of the clergy staff. So that's my visual observation. And we had gone to a Methodist church, uh, Kwong Lim, I think is what it's called, also. And we witnessed a similar um, composition at one of their midday services, which mm -hmm. was also about 10 o'clock. So I think what I didn't talk about, one of the things I'm conveying is this sense of regular worship um, on different days, at different times of days, and that was very meaningful. Now, how are these churches usually, um, you know, staffed by educated people, or do they have lay leaders, and how does that work? Because doing daily services every day is a, is a wear and tear on... Oh, sure. <laughs> Well, I think here is what, I, I don't know all of their breakdowns. I do know that in Korea, the concept of cell churches and community is very, very strong. And in fact, um, 
a church that's 100,000 people that we spent a lot of time in, there was no uh, invitation to Christian discipleship at the end. Wow. It mm -hmm. was very interesting. All of that work we later came to find out was based on cell work. So what they did have the Sunday we were there, they had a um, commitment, time of commitment, and they had those persons who were coming and being integrated into the church. They were sitting together, then they came up for a very brief ceremony of recognition and applause and appreciation, but all of that had already taken place outside of it. So there's no question why I couldn't articulate the specifics that they had a very active a small group cell base on that. Um, to give you some numbers that I am familiar with, at the Yodo Full Gospel Church, they have the, and we had a chance to um, witness that, as I said, on the Wednesday, and meet the son of the founding pastor there. And um, anyway, they have over 750 uh, pastors. Uh, or men, associate, we would mm -hmm. call them associate ministers or associate pastors here. Uh, and I'm talking about staff full person. So it seemed as if just doing the math, mm -hmm. what they had was a very sh large group of folks that basically was, that basically did a lot of the cell work. They were obviously mm -hmm. paid in full time in that particular church. And I did witness at these midday services, it became very clear that there was a large number of paid clergy because even at the Wednesday service at Yodo, there is a portion of time after the quote-unquote service was peace, done and there was this prayer. So when you talk about the Holy Spirit and this mm -hmm. kind of free prayer and a lot of laying on of hands and that kind of thing going on, there were a number of male, presumably clergy given the age and, and what I saw in terms of their dress, all mm -hmm. dressed very similarly, all of working age and the like that they came and they were uh, laying hands and praying for people in a particular location. Okay. So I do believe that, and I know for a fact, God, you know, some of the large, large groups of paid folks, and I should mention while I'm thinking about some of the other elements of the trip, we went to a hospital that was actually um, run by the church, okay. run by the Youngstown Church. Um, so that was, part of their, uh, that particular church's experience. We also had a chance to um, hear various persons speak. One of the thing, one of those sessions that was very meaningful to me was actually the founding pastor of a Methodist church, and he spent about an hour, hour, 15 minutes with us walking through 10 uh, things he's learned about uh, ministry and pastoral theology, and it was quite impactful. Um, his personal story, having been born in South uh, North Korea, having defected wow. at around age 20 through his service as a medic in the army. His recounting of a sense of God giving him a vision about building the largest Methodist church in Korea well before wow. it started and then mm -hmm. marching through and it became the largest church, uh, Methodist church not only in Korea but the largest Methodist church in the world. Um, and so uh, again I want to make sure both on this tape and otherwise the the point of size is not to say size is better or more confirmatory of what God is doing, mm -hmm. but to say that um, that's a part of their experience that was new for me. And also to be able to uh, talk with persons who had experienced humble beginnings numerically and to see how um, that translated for them. And I think we were blessed to be able to talk and relate with persons who, despite those kinds of experiences, were very, very um, um, down to earth and humble in the way in which they came off to us. Mm -hmm. And I believe that it was a uh, very uh, clear part. No. And I know um, it seems from what I've heard that in Asia, is where there's a lot of explosion in mainline denomination church growth. Okay. Whereas uh, here in the United States, it seems like it is, it is slightly declining. So did mm -hmm. you get that same sense that there was a lot of growth in the Methodist and Presbyterian and other churches there in that town? Yes, I, it seemed to me that regardless of what the affiliation was, that did not seem to be an impediment to what was going on. And of course, um, 
understanding what has happened in the United States helps us to def helps us to see why that is. I think in our own country to di differentiate that from Korea, mm -hmm. the mainline churches had some other issues going on in the society that impacted their growth. The reason why we have in America uh, northern and southern branches of uh, these quote-unquote mainline churches, including Southern Baptists and American Baptists or Northern Baptists, was over the issue of slavery and, and over the issue of, uh, some might say, well, it wasn't slavery per se, some might argue states' rights, but you know, I just happen to call it what I think it is, which was about the economic agenda and mm -hmm. about slavery right. and the like, and um, the North not needing slavery in the same way that the South did and, and all of that. But that, those, that separation occurred in churches even before the Civil War. So in the 1840s and 50s, you begin to see these splits within the churches. In our own country, um, the issue of civil rights ended up being a trigger point for many persons mm -hmm. to have left some of those denominations because of the stance that the official denominations took regarding civil rights. Now, almost all of us now in 2012 would say, there was a right side, but the fact of the matter is that many persons left those denominations into other denominations where at the time were either not dealing with the civil rights issues, and I'm specifically talking about as it relates to uh, non-black Christians, mm -hmm. specifically white Christians. They had um, those areas as well, so when you look at the South, for example, the uh, which I'm from, you begin to see, you know, it doesn't take much to see what happens mm -hmm. and when in the 60s and, and so forth and uh, as other groups started to emerge who focus on something other than civil rights and the like as part of the ministry, those churches then grew. So we have the quote-unquote growing churches, maybe Assemblies of God and other types mm -hmm. of non-denominational churches that didn't don't have to deal with that. Well, that's not Korea's history. Um, and even in the United States, uh, what little I have learned about the Korean church, they're not, you know, that I don't think the label on the church has been an issue. They're thriving mm -hmm. Presbyterian churches, just to use that as an example, right here in our own area, in Philadelphia, Korean churches. Um, um, as... Um, we learn there, and as we see here, Westminster Theological Seminary has a very strong Asian presence, specifically Korean presence. Mm -hmm. So it's not, I think that in America we have to at least be honest with ourselves and say some of that is not an issue of theology as much as it is about some stands on social issues that impacted those churches. And then there also were some other aspects as well uh, that do relate to theology. I think some of the mainline churches, for example, were very, very slow to acknowledge um, different manifestations of the Holy Spirit's work and present in worship and in the ministries. And I think in that regard, mainline denominational churches in the United States were slow in that regard. That has not been, they were not slow to do that, I don't believe, in Korea. Is there anything else you want to share? or? Um, I'm just thinking about different experiences that um, I mentioned our trip to the Buddhist temple. I, could, uh, I mentioned a bit about the early morning services. I did allude to the fact that there was a hospital that the Presbyterian Church had purchased. And, mm -hmm. uh, um, but this was one that was really interesting to me. And I'm, I'm not sure where I am theologically on this, to be honest with you, which is that the same church, uh, in their culture now, mm -hmm. different cultures, different, 